for learning and new education that's going on in Canvas industry. It's just, it's dynamic. I'm really grateful to be a part of it. Um, you might know my, some of my story. I was uh, had a collective in the county and we got raided and shut down by the Ventura County Sheriff's Department and a week before the election to legalize. And so we were out of business for a year fighting for a license to get back up and running. Ohio is that city that embraced us and said we believe that this medicine is valuable and wanted by our people and we're willing to give you a license to do business with So got that license at the state license now. <laughs> But it's always been about education for me. I didn't get into this as a party drug. I got into this much later in life. And I realized it could get me off antidepressants. So that's my story. It's like, stop taking antidepressants, you know. This is much better. Um, this is hopefully the first in a series of clinics we're hoping to offer. I know there's a lot of people that just need basic general information. They have no idea. There's, there's so much to know now. Um, maybe you had experience when you were younger, and it's just like, whoa, there's all these new things today. I don't know where to start. Um, we also want to do some specialized clinics for chronic pain, cancer, sleeping, and pets, and all the other issues that people are coming into our dispensary um, facing. We know there's just, you know, it's part of, part of the process is gathering community, finding what works for you might also work for the same person experiencing your same condition. Cannabis is this marvelous plant, but it's still poorly understood relatively, Dr. Jake and nurses and will speak better to that, but um, we are really grateful to have medical experts here talking today. One of the challenges that we face as a dispensary is people coming in asking us for medical advice, and none of us are trained medical professionals. So we walk a really fine line because we know so much about the products, we know so much about the plant, we've read up and studied, but we can't give you medical advice. So. We are glad you're here today. These people can come in a much better position to give medical advice. Um, they're experts in their fields. So let's get started. The format will um, basically we have two main speakers, and each speaker will talk for about 45 minutes, and we'll have about 15 minutes of QA. I hope everybody can hear it. I think the acoustics were good enough to use mic without microphones. If you just have trouble hearing anybody, just say speak up. Um, and then after the two main speakers in the Q&A, we have three sponsors here today that we work closely with. These are really high quality products, brands, professional companies, um, and they're gonna give short five to 10 minute spiels about their brand, their mission, their products. Um, and then we'll just kind of wrap it up and you can feel free to mingle with the vendors and the speakers. Um, cookies and water in the back if you need it. And I, um, so, Happy you're here. Um, okay, so Dr. Jake Felice is our first speaker. He writes and develops educational materials, including instructional videos for edu cannabis education curricula for academic institutions and private businesses, such as Seattle Central College and Medical Marijuana 411, a nationally recognized cannabis educator. His CME cannabis courses for doctors and pharmacists have now been translated into three languages. He's available for speaking and training seminars for both industry and academia. Dr. Felice continues to develop and write continuing education classes for physicians and nurses, including for the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine and the Washington Association for Naturopathic Physicians and Medical Marijuana 411. Dr. Felice is one of the few industry experts in the area of topical cannabis. So welcome, Dr. Jake Felice. Thank, thank you all so much for coming. I have a big voice, but if anybody is having trouble, just raise your hand and I will speak up. Um, I'm also, if you can't tell by my last name, Italian, and I move my hands a lot, so I'm going to be moving around a lot. Um, and hopefully that will be okay with Lewis in the back. If you're having trouble, Lewis, just let me know. Um, I'm excited to be here. Why am I excited to be here? Not just because of what I know and love about cannabis. So I am very much a pro-cannabis, uh, that's my bias as a clinician, uh, because of, I see what it does for my patients. Uh, but what I'm really also super excited about uh, is this community here in Ojai. Uh, my aunt and cousins have lived here and I have visited throughout the years. 
Uh, I have a main practice up in Seattle, Washington, and I also have a secondary <laughs> practice here in Galena. But this collective, the Sesame Creek Collective, um, is one of the companies or one of the organizations that is doing cannabis rights. And what do I mean by that? They are being very compliant with state regulations right now. And as Chelsea mentioned, um, they were shut down a while back. Does anyone know how many full-time jobs with benefits were lost when oh, they yeah. shut their business down? Over 20 full-time jobs left the community. And now what Ohio has done, and I think the collective wisdom, is they have legalized cannabis and tax revenues are going to be flowing for the city. Uh, so that's something I'm, I'm in favor of. Um, I'm also very much a big proponent of the science and the science in and around cannabis. So this is very much going to be a science-based uh, presentation, but also I'm very cognizant of the tradition of oral medicine uh, with cannabis that has gone back hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of years. Uh, my goal is to do about a 30,000 foot flyover of this very intricate system and I have decided I'm going to have more Q&A than just 15 minutes. So I'm going to try and get it done and have maybe say maybe 20 or so minutes because I think with the questions you'll really be able to see some of the information uh, that the presentation goes through. Um, let me ask uh, an audience, the audience a question. I'm sure most of you, but don't be shy if you haven't. Has everybody heard of THC before? Most folks, okay. Has, that, everybody, has anyone heard of CBD? Probably a lot of folks. Actually more hands for CBD. When I first started doing presentations about eight years ago, I knew I had a very educated audience member when they knew that even of the existence of CBD. Uh, CBD is a health benefiting molecule in the plant. Uh, THC has its role. There are over 600 positive uh, chemicals in cannabis that can be used for health. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, but right now what I want to talk about is a little history. Um, I did a blog post a while back uh, from the Journal of Experimental Botany. It's a peer-reviewed medical journal. And there was buried in Central Asia a little over 2,000 years ago a cannabis shaman um, who amongst his possessions was uh, a harp, a bow and arrow, and a satchel of about 750 grams of cannabis flour and another small bag of seeds. Uh, the uh, researchers tried to grow those seeds. Are there any strain hunters, super savvy folks? Okay, well, we won't talk about that then. The strain hunters tried to grow the seeds. Uh, the genetics were too old, they couldn't be grown, but they did genetic analysis of this 2,000-year-old cannabis plant. And what they found, uh, they looked at THC levels and they looked at CBD levels. And anyone want to guess in particular what they found what, what they found when they analyzed this cannabis. Oh, CBD was higher than... Great. It's, everybody says that, and it's a very educated uh, answer because in its wild state, the cannabis plant is CBD dominant. Wow. So CBD, as the plant grows in the wild all throughout Eurasia, it's a CBD dominant plant with very low THC, but this guy mm -hmm. had different stuff. It was a little under 20% THC and less than 1% CBD, plus the plants were feminized, meaning there were no seeds in the buds, the seeds were, the seeds were separate. So what, any growers in the room can tell me what was going on at that point in time. What were they using this plant for? Religious. Religious or to get high, we don't really know, but the THC was very much a fact. And so we know that human beings, oh, and by the way, it's very interesting, even though he's in the middle of Central Asia 2,000 years ago, it was a blue, he had blue eyes, you can tell from the chromosomes. Um, uh, and so I find that very fascinating. There is a long history of cannabis uh, for medicine. Um, our Federal Drug Administration has cannabis as a Schedule One drug, but do you know what they say about botanical drugs? They don't consider cannabis to be a botanical. 
They don't consider it to be a botanical, but if it falls under the classification of botanical drugs, the FDA has a completely different system for the drug approval process. Um, and what that means for plant-based medicine, and it's directly in their white paper on the topic, traditional medicines may, the, the, the fact that a traditional medicine has existed for hundreds of years, according to the FDA, allows clinicians to make educated guesses on dosages without clinical trials. It's actually, there's a very interesting dynamic with this plant going on on the federal level. I'll talk about that more if you have uh, questions, um, but I want to, to, to talk about why is it in the world that plants make these molecules. You can see up here on the far right, you have a, uh, the THC in the purple and anandamide in the blue. Has anyone heard of anandamide? Does anyone speak Sanskrit? Does anyone <laughs> word, know what the word ananda means? It means bliss in Sanskrit. Our body makes a brain chemical called anandamide and makes another one that just so happens to fit like a lock and key into these cannabis receptors. It's like nature made a key 200 million years ago that fits a lock that's 600 million years old. Why in the world do plants do that? Who here had tea or coffee this morning? Good. Any? Not good. Maybe not so good. I did too. <laughs> Probably why I'm speaking so quickly now. Uh, so, so good. So, so there's a reason that the coffee plant makes that molecule. Uh, what about nicotine? I don't recommend it as a health, but any nicotine users in here? Okay. How about, how many people when you tried smoking, I'm talking mostly guys here, because the first time I tried nicotine, it was with a cigar, down a dirt road, I was probably 11 or 12. What did I do? I was throwing up in the ditch. And I don't use tobacco anymore. Why does the tobacco plant make nicotine? Yes, sir? Probably as a deterrent to be eaten. As a deterrent to be eaten, absolutely right. That is one of the huge reasons that uh, and it is specifically designed, they speci the, the molecule is specifically designed to affect the physiology of other organisms to prevent them from being eaten. What about caffeine? It's different. So any thoughts on why the coffee plant makes caffeine? So it can, oh good, pollination, good. Pollination is the attraction of insects. Roses smell beautiful for a reason. They also look beautiful for a reason. But in this particular case, what, what the plant is doing is the insects get a little caffeine buzz when they visit the coffee plant. So the insects have a positive reason to come back and visit. And then after pollination, the coffee produces its fruit, which is in a bean, kind of, uh, 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 and then the fruits fall to the ground in and around the trees, and that caffeine is in a much higher concentration in the beans, so that prevents other plants from growing. When uh, Thomas Jefferson and our founding fathers brought hemp to America, because they did, and they were actually required to grow hemp, uh, George Washington, uh, Thomas Jefferson, root hemp. What they found was in the uh, any, any ponds in and around where cannabis was grown, all the fish died. Ooh. What happened? What happened was the CBD in its acid form got washed into the pond. It killed the algae. That was the food source for the fish, and all the fish died. So this plant has, for hundreds of millions of years, been making molecules specifically to interact with other organisms, one of which, coincidentally or not, happens to be ours, uh, us here. Now, that's exciting, but what really excites me is this, data. Um, I'm gonna walk over here. This is data from opiate deaths in the state of Colorado. And it's so dramatic, I'm gonna get up here. Deaths have been increasing since 2000. What happened right there, where they started going down again? Legalization. Legalization of medical marijuana in the state of Colorado in 2014. 
Uh, and we see an immediate downturn in opiate-related deaths. If we look at all licensed states across the board, we get something like this. If you live in a licensed marijuana state, which we all do, there is a 25% reduction in opioid overdose deaths with medical marijuana programs. Additionally, what it appears, and we know this, we have data from the CDC on, on all classes of medication. What's super exciting about it is, the longer the medical cannabis program has been in place, the better the opiate uh, statistics are. And my hypothesis is that is because in licensed medical states, there is a higher degree of education across the populace, awareness, uh, and access. So I think that it's a very important thing. One of the main reasons to use cannabis medically is because of its low toxicity. How many uh, overdose deaths from marijuana? <laughs> Zero, ever. Billions and billions served, right? <laughs> Zero deaths, okay. What about opiates? Not the case, right? We all, we all know that it's a crisis. But what a lot of us don't know, and one of the messages I'm taking to doctors, because believe it or not, doctors don't know this, uh, comes from CDC data. So this is the Center for Disease Control. It's super conservative data. Uh, if you are an opioid naive patient, naive doesn't mean you don't know anything about anything, it just means you've never tried an opiate medication before. If you're given a one day prescription of opiates, which hardly is ever done, there's usually more than a one day, you have after a year, a six, one year later, a 6% chance of being on that opiate medication. Uh, if it is a 28 day prescription, 13.5%. That's one in 10 is using opiates a year later. My brother chews tobacco. Uh, we went to a rodeo. He got a can of skull. The tobacco companies know that if a, a, a person uses that whole can, they're going to be a customer for life. My brother's still a lifetime customer. Uh, God bless him. Um, approximately 7% of opiate prescriptions are for 30 days. So if you are over 31 days in a year, there is a 30% risk. Now, this is not a problem if people are in pain and they're getting pain relief, which is what opiates do. But they have a very high cost and that cost is not only the mortality, but also it can also cause organ uh, sickness as well. Um, if we look here, same data after three years, you will see a very damning statistic that after, if somebody is given a 30 day prescription of opiates about three years later, they're still filling that prescription. Now, what is unique about opiates is that even though they do relieve pain, they don't really increase function. We know this from some new studies. So folks do get pain relief, which is good and it's compassionate, but they're not, it is not helping them get back to work faster. It's not helping them cook dinner better. It's just helping with the pain and it has a whole host of side effects. Uh, today, 91 Americans die every day from an opioid overdose and the majority over six out of ten uh, are involving an opioid. Now, when heroin addiction first came to our shores, oh, say in the 60s, 70s, the heroin addicts were getting addicted from buying from pushers on the street. Now the majority of heroin addiction comes from pain pills. Uh, so we have a huge problem with that, and part of what cannabis does is it does help folks uh, it helps the opiates work better. So if the opiates have not been working well, it helps actually helps them to work better. That's one of the reasons folks may be using less. Also, if there are symptoms of withdrawal from the opiates, the cannabis can help that as well. So how in the world does one medication work maybe to help people in pain? It's also good for nausea and vomiting. It's also good for muscle spasms. It may be involved in helping the body deal with autoimmune diseases such as MS. Uh, we have a lot of data on MS now, uh, huge amounts, more than you would be, uh, you would be shocked to know how much data. Um, so how is it that cannabis does all these things? 
helps some folks with anxiety, helps almost everybody sleep. How is it that it's doing all these things? Is it, is it, is it magical? Is it not really doing them and we're just making great big placebo? Any thoughts on that? Relaxation. One of the things that it does is it relaxes folks. I was thinking more along the lines of, of, uh, of biochemically has to do with the endocannabinoid system. Who's heard of the endocannabinoid system before? Not quite as many as have heard of THC and CBD. Endocannabinoid system is like the internet of our body. If I'm an immune cell down by a little toe and there is somebody cuts their toe, that immune cell can send an email to the entire rest of the immune system as well as every nerve cell in the body, letting them know that an event has occurred. It is uh, 600 million years old and it was formed as an interface when single cell organisms got together to form bodies, they needed an interface to share information, such as sharing food reserves to help get rid of toxicity and to deal with food. So from the very beginning of the design of a body, the endocannabinoid system is hardwired into the physiology and there are more cannabinoid receptors in our nervous system than any other type of receptor. Why is that amazing? Well, first of all, it's the biggest system in our nervous system that we know of. And yet most doctors know very, very little about this uh, endocannabinoid system. Um, and if you think of each of those receptors as kind of a little key on a piano, the, the size of the organ and the keyboard, there would be so many notes that could be played through the endocannabinoid system versus any other physiologic system. I will tie this in later with the Q&A, uh, but it's incredibly complex, and for those of us who think there's not a lot of science uh, and are science-based, that's, uh, I think, a reasonable thing given the status of the media, but there's actually so much science, more science on cannabis than we have on just about any other plant on the planet uh, for health purposes. This is a little bit about the exchange that's going on in the nervous system between two nerve cells. We're not going into the details, but the most important thing about cannabis for pain in the nervous system is that it helps information go backwards. So the normal flow of information from the nerve cells is going this way, and the cannabinoid system is going that way. How might that be effective in treating seizures, for example? Well, the nervous system in a seizure event, all the nerve cells are screaming at each other. There, it, it's, it's, it's like one of those shows on reality television where everybody's screaming and nobody's listening. Sounds like a cultural problem that we all have here today, uh, <laughs> doesn't it? So everybody's scre all the nerve cells are screaming at each other and nobody's listening. The endocannabinoid system gives the cell on the receiving end of all that signal to say, hey, time out, I'm a little overwhelmed here. Let's slow down the situation. It's called retrograde transmission. You can Google that. Retrograde transmission. It's part of why cannabis helps with pain signals. And it does a bunch of other things in addition to just retrograde inhibition, uh, anti-inflammatory effects, relaxation effects, um, lots of positive effects in the gut. We know from some Israeli studies that smoked cannabis, and I don't recommend that my patients smoke cannabis, but that smoked cannabis has been positively affecting folks with ulcerative colitis. It was a very small study. Almost all of them got relief from smoked cannabis, and part of what's going on in the digestive tract is that the inflammation and tissue injury uh, are being reduced. This system is all over the body, uh, we're not going to go into the difference, but these are all of the brain and organ systems that have cannabinoid receptors. And it does crazy things like helping with bone repair. How is it that one thing does this? It's because this system is operating on a, on a level pharmacologically that is a little bit different than our standard receptor systems, something we do in um, my advanced courses for doctors is taken through that. 
The part of what is going on is this combination of effects between some of the beneficial different molecules in marijuana. Um, CBD on the top left relieves spasms, it's a pain reliever, helps with nausea, helps with anxiety, helps people sleep. Uh, lots of different chemicals doing different things. Um, and, and, and so all of them are important. There are also, my favorite class of molecules are the terpenes. Um, they're also doing a lot of different things, and terpenes are responsible for the aromas, uh, and they have physiologic effects at very low concentrations. Um, this is from uh, a uh, cannabis and cannabinoid research journal. It's peer reviewed. We think that there's something called clinical endocannabinoid deficiency that is affecting some of these disease processes that we really don't know much about, including migra migraine headache, fibromyalgia, uh, irritable bowel, and other treatment resistant uh, syndromes. We think that folks um, under stress or under insult are having their, this endocannabinoid system altered, and that's part of the reason that cannabis helps, is it can restore some of the balance to that system. Um, and you hear a lot of folks talking poorly about THC. There's a reason for that. Why do a lot of people not like THC? They don't like to be high. Like yeah. Exactly. It, there are two major areas of side effects from me medical marijuana. One is from the smoke, so we don't have most people smoking at all anymore. And two are from side effects of THC. But THC does have positive effects that can be helpful for some. Uh, part of what is important with medical marijuana is that the patient needs to develop a learning relationship so that they can understand how to make good choices in the marketplace. That's part of why we're here today. Um, and when they make good choices, a lot of the times they get good relief. I would say just for my patients, hardly anyone is not able to use cannabis to get them to sleep. Now, people do have trouble managing the side effects of THC, but just about everyone gets sleep relief. Just about everyone gets pain relief. Uh, lots of folks get muscle spasm relief. Not everyone gets relief from seizures, but a lot of people do. Um, the actual for nausea and vomiting, the conventional pharmaceutical medications are better than marijuana for nausea and vomiting. They work better for nausea, but they only work in 70% of the patients. So if you are a, a chemo patient and you're part of that 30% group that the conventional medications are not working for you, Cannabis is a godsend because it allows you to stay in treatment and it allows you to have some enjoyment in your life through what is really a hellacious or can be a hellacious experience for a lot of folks uh, and their families. Plus it's low toxic, so it's not advancing the disease burden. And I think also just to get a little woo woo here as a psychoactive, when folks are looking back on their lifespan of decades, sometimes a little shift can give you a perspective and say, oh, maybe this part of my life means something different to me now. So I do think there are some therapeutic roles uh, for THC, um, but more honestly for CBD. CBD works in so many different ways. I wanna do Q&A, so I'm not going to go into some of the details, but one of the things that's so fantastic about CBD is not only does it have positive effects, but it also reduces the negative effects from THC. Um, and that happens in different ratios. So there are a few ways that plants have synergy. One is that the positive effects can be magnified. So we know if we combine CBD plus THC, you get better pain relief. We know if you combine THC plus CBN, uh, you get more sleep relief. So that's one way, is increased positive effects can cause synergy. Another way is decreasing the negative effects can cause synergy. Pharmacologically speaking, increasing bacterial resistance or decreasing bacterial resistance to the medication uh, is a way that there's synergy. Believe it or not, cannabis does that. And another huge method of synergy that some parts of cannabis do is enhanced absorption. 
Uh, that's a pharmacologic mechanism of synergy. And when, for example, you use the terpene myrcene, has anyone heard of myrcene? You're probably a superstar if you are. Myrcene is the sleep-inducing terpene uh, that's responsible for a lot of couch lock effect. Mm. One of the things that myrcene does is it helps THC get to the brain better. So you're not necessarily taking more, but what you're using is acting in a better way. So, th so, so the, the synergistic effects are valuable uh, and they're measurable. Um, and uh, this is just uh, uh, on the nerve side of things. Cannabinoids reduce damage to myelin caused from inflammation and multiple sclerosis. We now have lots of mechanisms. The most important thing I do for my patients is help them managing side effects. And when we have low THC ratios, like 18 to 1, 8 to 1, you have a much better profile of side effects from THC, and that as the ratios increase and as the amounts increase, we get more side effects. Anxiety, temporary short-term memory loss, it's not permanent. Sedation, which can be good for some folks if they're, not, if they're restless or can't sleep. Hunger, which can be good for some folks. Um, uh, and racing hard, which nobody likes, and uh, is one of the biggest uh, problems to manage for certain patients like the atrial fibrillation, which is why it's very important that people get good medical advice if they have some of these conditions. Um, and one of my areas where I am, um, uh, I think I'm the only doctor who has presented to other doctors on how topicals work, uh, but I think that some of the topical products are very valuable. Um, they have a wide range of uses, but just about every pain patient, not everyone, but just about every pain patient, I think, should be on some form of a topical. Um, as you all can see, I'm really passionate about this. I'm kind of losing my voice a little bit, so I'm going to open up to Q&A, and we're going to do this back and forth, and I'll try some of these things in um, as we move forward. So, any questions? I saw your hand go up first. Um, are the drug companies coming at us yet? I, okay, so yes, I think they are. And I think that the way to do, to look at any kind of a pharmaceutical is you have to look at the data and you have to look and follow the money. Now, if we look at the data, uh, there's a new drug called Epidiolex, which is basically a high CBD product that just got FDA approval. It's a patented medication, meaning they can make some money on it. Um, and there's another uh, product that has been licensed in Canada and in many other areas uh, called Sativex, which is a one-to-one. -one. Does anyone, has anyone heard of these products? A few people. So, um, Sativex has a patent, and there are patents on both of these drugs. But does, has anyone heard of hash oil before? Yeah. Okay, basically these, these things, if you look at the inserts, they're hash oil. That is what they are that has been winterized, which means they take some of the fats out of them so that it stays a liquid in room temperature. Um, and it's basically a hash oil, and I don't see how it's a unique product because it's been a product, which means if it's a patent, you gotta have a unique product. Right. How old is the technology that they are using in this very scientific patented <laughs> process how old is the extraction technology? It's in their patent. If you can look it up on the Google patent. Probably that shaman bit of that. The shaman. <laughs> Please say that again, and I'll tie it in later. But that's not where I was going. But I can do that. I can do that. And we'll talk about sommeliers and wine. But don't mention that. Um, uh, so um, their their uh, patent technology was developed in 1822. It's almost 200 years old. We should all be able to use this. And guess how much Sativex, or sorry, the, the, the THC uh, uh, Marinol product, guess how much it costs for a month? About $800. And if it's off label, who's going to pay for that? Some people are. Do you know the main reason that people get a, a, a Marinol prescription, in my experience? Sorry. So they can pass their urinalysis for work. That's the main reason they get this prescribed. And then, also very interestingly, when you have that on, uh, on board in California, 
it nullifies the legality of all your analysis tests that you take. So I, I, I say look at the research and, and, and what I was discussing is in the patent um, that has been filed for these products. Also, they're not measuring terpene molecules in these pharmaceutical product, uh, products. They're calling them in, incidental molecules and they're not measured. So their terpene profile may be inconsistent from one batch to the next. Um, uh, I have a chip on my shoulder against GW Pharmaceuticals uh, with this product because I think that they've done some great things with research, but I think they are going to make an immense amount of money um, and, and, and it's just botanical medicine. So They'll probably start putting man-made, they probably won't be natural anymore. I think that it is an all-natural product, <laughs> like similar, like a hash oil would be. But uh, uh, a, lot of man, a lot of pharmaceutical manufacturers are looking into specific molecules and they're also looking at affecting enzyme systems that affect other levels. So, so there, there are kind of microscopy. Mm -hmm. um, good, uh, another question, yes sir. Um, I'll give you a practical application earlier. I have a, like, I guess I had a lot of pain, and it's caused from a, a muscle atrophy from back a uh, year ago, like back in the 80s. So my uh, thigh is pretty much atrophy. So it's constant, and of course, sitting here, I'm trying to squirt, and that's why I started bombing. Um, I smoke, and I, I take tincture, and I, and I do um, the um, cartridge, oil cartridge, and I get moderate pain relief and have other benefits. Uh, it may not, I but, but, but uh, I would suggest a good quality topical, yeah. um, uh, and by helping, I would mean it might take a point or two off for you, which can be significant, um, and I'm not here to give medical advice today, but typically what we see with a topical is about a two point reduction, so if you have a knee that's at a six out of 10, usually a topical gets it to a five or a four. There's a big difference at work, especially if you stand, a six versus a four. I personally find it hard to think through difficult things at a six, but with a four, I can push it away. Um, with topicals, CBD is much more easily absorbed through the skin um, than THC, but what the study shows is that both are important. So you definitely want to have a product with a huge bolus of CBD in there, and I find that also THC is very helpful. Um, there is a line of fascia that runs through there, which are kind of the she's. Um, I feel that those can benefit uh, from some of it. Uh, so topical application, and with topicals, you need to use a lot because they're dose dependent. Manufacturers, if you're a manufacturer of topical, we should talk because most people are dosing the products way too low in my opinion. And the best way uh, to do that is either to have a good affordable product uh, or to have something. I don't want my patients thinking about price when they're rubbing it on because I want them to use a lot. So there's, uh, there's some uh, things with that. I haven't asked anyone in the back yet, so yes ma'am. So, two-prone thing, you were just saying how you thought it could help the sheets. Yeah. But is that sort of just like the myelin insulator? Oh, uh, the uh, similar category. So, okay. so I'm ta I was talking about muscle sheaths, and then myelin is a sheath that our nerves have on them. Okay. Both of them are, are a type of tissue called connective tissue. Mm -hmm. So the myelin tissues are connective tissue, but they're different. structurally different. Uh, but myelin uh, in, in all cells of the connective tissue have cannabis receptors on them and they're very important. The main role that myelin does is protects brain cells. And then you talked about broken bones healing faster. Mm -hmm. Could it be related to osteoporosis? Well, that that we have to be super cautious when we talk about specific diseases, but we can say in mouse models, yes. We can also say that most traditional um, osteoporosis and osteopenia medications are focusing on increasing mineralization of the bone matrix. The matrix is connective tissue. Matrix is always connected. Um, so they incre the, the pharmaceuticals increase the bone density of the, of the minerals, but they may not actually be helping the lattice to make them stronger. The CBD is also working to make the lattice stronger in animal models. So if I have a patient who has chronic pain and is uh, postmenopausal or perimenopausal, 
I feel very good about their bones when they are using a CBD product, even though that may not be what we're treating. I just feel that so that's would a, a good thing. Would be a good, that would be a good uh, I, again, that's medical advice. I think that the two most versatile forms of cannabis is a coconut oil and a tincture. You can do just about anything with those two products. Um, tincture is a liquid for those of you who don't know. Question over here. I'm sorry there's so many coming. Yes, ma'am. I'll get you next. I, I have a friend that uh, does, doesn't really smoke it anymore. She juices the uh -huh. plant. I mean, what, has there been any research done on Juicing. A little bit of research. What is the difference now? If it's fresh juiced, folks do not get high. Even if it's a THC dominant plant, that's because the THC in the raw plant is in the form of an acid, a THC acid, which does not cause psychoactivity. Um, there's a minimal amount of research on it. There's more coming. Uh, I find it to have anti-inflammatory effects. There is a medical doctor in um, California up north, uh, William Courtney, who is a big proponent of, uh, of raw juicing. He believes that as the body ages, part of what happens is the endocannabinoid system, the internet of the body, doesn't work as well. So it's kind of like instead of running that video really quickly for you know a young 18, 22 year old, that video is loading quickly. If the endocannabinoid system is slow, we might be waiting a long time for things uh, to happen. So 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 that's something I think that can uh, can be addressed. Um, Having taken a one-to-one -one tincture, I tried a one-to-one -one gel cap. Oh, yeah. Much more dramatic THC reaction to the gel cap than to the tincture. Why? Uh, I would guess enhanced absorption. Yes. And uh, there are many things that can cause enhanced absorption. One is a process called emulsification. The fancy word is nanotechnology. Do you know what nanotechnology is with marijuana? You get some dish soap, and you put the dish soap in with oil, and you shake it up, and it forms bubbles, and those bubbles, because the, because the lipid surface is broken up, penetrates better. So one potential, because it's in a gel, it's a liquid, it might be absorbed better. The other thing is, is there could be terpene molecules in one, they haven't been measured, and that'll remind me of the sommelier thing, but there'll be terpene molecules that haven't been measured that could be increasing absorption. Myrcene is one of them. We don't know. And again, uh, a good reason for laboratory testing. Back to the sommelier thing. The nose knows. Do you know what, who knows? I'm assuming there's wineries all around here. Does everyone know what a sommelier is? How do you, how do you get your certificate? You have to take a test, don't you? And part of that test is the practical, where they line up a bunch of glasses of wine for you to taste. And if you're an expert, you can not only tell what year and type of uh, it was, but where the soil was that it was grown. All from the nose. All from the nose. I think that if you are smelling your cannabis products over years, decades, you're going to get better. Okay? And now in Washington State, one of the laws is you can't smell the marijuana. So in Washington State, you're not allowed to, you can't, it's crazy, you can't. When you go to the store, can I smell it? No, no, we don't, we're not allowed. Oh, ah, growing your own. Everybody's growing their own anyway these days. Say that again? I said everybody's growing their own. Everybody's growing their own. That's the best way. If you are worried about pesticides on your marijuana, there's two things you can do. You can have a really good company, um, really good company, like these guys back here, or you can grow your own. If you grow your own, you know whether or not there's miracle Grow on there, right? And miracle Grow, if you read it, there are chemicals in there not for human consumption, let alone human inhalation. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, ma'am. So I have a question about magnesium. You were talking about so CBD and uh, uh, the muscle relief. Mm -hmm. So um, I, my son had a horribly bad muscle thing. So the doctor said to use some magnesium. Mm -hmm. And so we did. It has worked fabulously. It's better for sleep. So in comparison to magnesium and CBD, I'm doing topical also. Mm -hmm. But could you speak to that a tiny bit? Magnesium is most of us know this, but magnesium is a mineral, right? 
And magnesium is a mineral that is kind of similar to calcium. And you've heard of a class of heart medications called calcium channel blockers. Part of what's going on with the calcium channel blockers, the calcium gets blocked so the heart doesn't contract as much. So the magnesium is acting as a calcium channel blocker to decrease muscle contraction strength, and it is a mild muscle relaxer. Main side effects from magnesium come from milk of magnesia, which is a magnesium product, Diarrhea, because it's a mineral that can pull water into the stool. So there's only so high you can dose magnesium orally. Some people will do an IV. Um, the mechanisms that marijuana uses to reduce muscle uh, uh, spasm are different. So there, we don't have studies, so we can't say there are additive or synergistic effects, but we know that magnesium is a good muscle relaxant, and we know that cannabis is a good muscle relaxant and that if there is a nutritional deficiency in magnesium, even you have to correct that uh, because even a good product, even a good cannabis product may not be effective if there's another underlying uh, cause. So both working together and always do with magnesium to bowel tolerance is how that is recommended. And one more and then I'll, I'll ask him back. Me? Oh, did you have a follow-up? Yes, so the follow-up with the uh, CBD oil is heart patients. So heart patients, if they have a bypass and things like that, can they use the oil as compared I, I to feel safe, and again, I can't give specifics, but I feel safer when my cardiac patients are on a higher CBD product. There's a really great mouse study on, um, uh, they, they induced heart attack in mice. And the control group had, and they measured the size of the depth of the, of the heart tissue. So there's a control group that didn't receive anything. The CBD group that received the, um, and they're mice, not humans, that received the CBD had an infarct size, meaning the area of muscle compromise 66% smaller than the controls. And they contro also in this study, they control for blood flow. So the C they, they block the blood flow. So the C CBD does have an ability to increase blood flow, but they blocked it, and it is working by some other mechanism other than increasing the blood flow. Um, so I feel very good when my cardiac patients are on CBD. I get a little nervous with THC, especially for folks with heart regulation issues, uh, because that needs to be more tightly monitored, and those folks can have problems with caffeine and all types of other things. Yes, sir. Can you just elaborate on uh, CBDA and THCA with, with, with respect to inflammation as opposed to non-A so, so the question is CBDA, so we've heard of CBD, CBDA, THC, THCA. The A stands for acid. Mm -hmm. CBD acid is in the raw plant. Um, and that's what, remember, uh, would wash into the streams and into the ponds, and then uh, that's THC acid, or sorry, CBD acid. THC acid is also in the plant. Uh, we know that the THC acid has some good anti-inflammatory properties, um, and, and we think that it's logical that that, for as we age, might actually be becoming a dietary insufficiency. We need more information, but will, if you want to Google somebody, William Courtney is a doctor who talks a lot about that. Um, he's got some ideas that I think are also a little out there, but I like that particular one uh, that, that, that he does. Uh, CBD acid, I honestly don't know very much uh, about it have, because it hasn't been studied as much, but it's going to have a slightly different effect or a dramatically different effect than CBD just because we know it's a different molecule and we know that there are differences when we change small aspects of these molecules. So I wish I knew more about CBDA. Um, I think that raw juice cannabis is a good idea, but you pretty much have to either have a good source of it or be growing it yourself. Um, so what does CBD stand for? What is CBD CBD, stand for? Okay, CBD stands for cannabidiol, and it is just one of the chemicals in um, uh, that the plant makes. Stands for cannabidiol and excuse me if you can read here the CBD and the THC they're, they're slightly right so they're they're, they're uh, okay.
<laughs> um, uh, is that helpful? Yeah. Okay. And okay. then THC, the initial scan for tetrahydrocannabinol, and sometimes there's a delta nine or D nine, and there's a delta nine, and it just is a, they're referring to so which carbon it's in. I haven't used any of this. Mm -hmm. but back when I was a kid, I got stoned, and, and so was was that like? You just, someone just took a plant and dried it up, and it, was that THC and CBD? Oh, yeah, I see where you're going. How does CBD, how does THCA become THC? Is that where? Yeah, like, yeah, how do you get just the CBD oil? Like how do you, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I mean, <laughs> so whenever I got high in high school, was I smoking CBD? When I got home, when I got, I won't answer you. When I got high in high school, was I smoking CBD or THC? Probably THC, because if you look at black market strains, uh, um, the, the, the constituency has changed. But from just about the beginning of the black market, THC strains were selected for. Um, so, what's going on with THC acid versus THC, and how does it work? There's a chemical process that happens when you take the raw plant material and you heat it, whether you cook it or you burn it with a, with a match and a, and a pipe or whatever, that heat change, just like when we cook eggs and the egg white, whites turn to turn color in the, in the pan, that's a chemical change that's happening. Same thing is happening with the THC. When it's heated, it, the, the shape of the molecule changes a little bit. And that, that's how it fits into that lock and key a little bit differently. So uh, the heating process is actually uh, chemically changing the THCA molecule into a THC or into a delta-9 THC. Um, now, you asked about just getting one or the other. The studies are very clearly showing that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. So it is very clear now that THC plus CBD is better for pain than each of them alone. But what we are finding is that we are usually needing very much lower amounts of THC than we had previously thought. Um, and then, the, I, I'm, was that okay with you? Yeah. That, okay, good. Far in the back, you've been having him for a while. Okay. Thanks. Um, so I'm, I'm taking a, an antidepressant, anti-anxiety medication, mm -hmm. venlafaxine, mm -hmm. and I don't know if anyone knows, but the side effects when you miss is they're horrible withdrawals. And somebody told me that that um, you can take THC and you can take the cannabis instead. And it'll have the it'll help as much. And I don't know. I don't agree with that. Okay. Um, when when. Uh, when you are, when there are, and, and there are classes of medication, there, there are t classes of patients that are high risk for marijuana. Um, those include pregnant and nursing moms, in my opinion. I know there's data out there, but I don't go there. Uh, another group of patients that are at high risk are youth under the age of 25, believe it or not. And that's a relative risk, uh, and, and it's again a THC based risk. A third group of patients, immune compromised patients or patients on immunosuppressive medication. A fourth group, patients with psychiatric diagnoses. Um, THC in particular has the capacity to increase anxiety, irritability. Um, those classes of medications need to be, patients need to be brought off very carefully. Yeah. I have a PEP hypothesis. I have seen it in a few cases, but my personal belief is that people have huge amounts of trouble when they go quit cold turkey off of some of their psych meds and also when they're switching some of their psych meds. And this is a hypothesis. I don't have any data for it, but I think a lot of school shootings are from people who have medication and are either discontinued or shifting classes. And I don't know, I, I've heard that a few times and that's just a thought process, but it can put you in a world of hurt. So always when managing psychiatric medication should be done with the help of a professional. Some types, there are more kinds of cannabis than there are types of dogs. So if you want to find a dog to pull sled, you, you probably don't want to go to the Westminster Dog Show to decide which of your dogs you're choosing. So with cannabis, a particular type might be helpful for you, but if you don't know that, you really, in my opinion, need some uh, professional assistance. And are there that. any professionals to know? <laughs> I mean, that's my big question. I don't want to do it on my there, own. There are some good folks in town, and there is still quite a bit of stigma in the medical community. I know some good docs who actually do cannabis, 
And and one of them, she's in Ventura. She's like, oh, I don't want I don't want my colleagues knowing I'm doing this. One more question. One more question, and then and then I'm sorry. I'm here, Susan. Perhaps will be speaking in the end. So, yes. So, 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 please stay tuned. We're going to answer all your questions. But, yeah, one more, and then we'll have uh, okay. My question was with the answer. Could you uh, talk a little bit about the difference between the CD, CDB and the and the other one. The TNT? Sure, sure, sure. We know a couple new things about cancer because um, there's some new human studies that are very exciting. One is one of those drugs that I just spent a lot of time bashing because it's a patented medication, um, the Sativex. Uh, uh, also just came out with a human trial on a glioblastoma type of uh, cancer. It's a brain cancer. and. This was a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, so the quick answer is we think that both are important. Both THC and CBD are important because they're modulating the immune process. Now, I cannot say legally, and it would be very irresponsible and unethical for me to say that marijuana cures cancer in humans. It's too early to say that. Um, but we can say that it cures breast cancer in laboratory rats. We can say that across multiple mechanisms there are potential benefits, and we now have a human study with a one-to-one -one at relatively low dose. The control group, meaning the group that did not receive the cannabis, lived about a year. I think it was 360 days on average. The CBD THC one-to-one -one group, which was a relatively low, they got almost another year of life. Um, and Part of what we think is happening is that it is an immune modulator. Uh, and um, one of the things, this is just one of the things that marijuana does. It's like in the Lord of Rings when Frodo put his ring on and nobody could see it. That's what cancer does. It, it has a ring and it puts it on and the immune becomes invisible to the immune system. Part of what marijuana is doing is it is making the invisibility of the cancer cells easier for the immune system to detect. So it's doing, it also is preventing the blood supply of cannabis from, or from, of cancer rather, from forming. So it's doing a lot of positive things, but we need, you know, you just heard me say we have so much information, but we also, we need so much more. And in, in particular, cancer is one of those areas. Um, I, 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 I think, I fear that I'm a little overly optimistic because if you think about in terms of the individual, it can be such a catastrophic diagnosis. But in terms of the collective, I'm very optimistic about not necessarily cure, but increased life uh, number of quality days is huge. Keeping weight on a third of cancer patients, um, the cancer doesn't kill them, they, it starves them to death. So as the, the body gets skinnier and skinnier, the, the, so it's helping on multiple mechanisms. Um, uh, this has been a pleasure. You can find me, I, I have cards in the back. You can find me online at drjfelice.com. Um, Nurse Susan has more terrific information, so stay tuned.